Please are in listen only mode. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Bill Baker. I'm with Firestorm. And it's kind of a beautiful day here in the Atlanta area, and we're glad that you're able to join us for this Crisis Coach webinar series that is presented by our great friends at Georgia Independent School Association. Today we're going to be discussing why intelligence can make you feel so dumb. This is part of the Crisis Coach webinar series. Our presenter today is going to be Karen Mazzuto. She's the Executive Vice President of Firestorm in charge of social media analysis. We also need friends. Firestorm Solutions on Facebook, Twitter, we're known as Firestorm Soul. There is a hashtag. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risk and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. We do want to remind you that the presentation today is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. This information should also be discussed with your organization's personal counsel. And please do not interpret this information as legal advice or legal opinion. The Georgia Independent School Association is the host and underwriter of this Crisis Coach webinar series. This is the fifth in the 2016 series. You can go to Firestorm.com and you can watch past webinars in this series, even prior years, and register for future webinars. Today, as I mentioned, it's why intelligence make you feel so dumb. Jeff Jackson is the president of Georgia Independent School District. He's not able to join us today. He's out assisting some of the clients of uh, the organization. Our presenter is our good friend and our good associate, Karen Masulo, Chief Intelligence Officer, Executive Vice President, Predictive Intelligence at Firestorm. Karen, over to you. Thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate it today. And uh, do hope I am uh, not in Georgia today. I'm in South Carolina, but uh, I think we both have the same weather, and I'm enjoying um, our southern spring uh, as much as anybody can. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be talking about really uh, how data in impact decision making in your schools and in your school systems and uh, what we can do to, be, to make better decisions uh, as it goes. Uh, on the right hand side of your screen if you have a question there is a little go to webinar panel there and it's got a little chat function in it and you can ask a question through the chat function and Bill Baker will let me know if there's something that we need to address during the session. If not, we will get to those questions after the session and personally reply. You can also email us at webinars at firestorm.com. Or you can personally reach out to me at kmasulo at firestorm.com. We'll be happy to answer any questions uh, or provide any service that we can for you. OK, we're talking about why intelligence makes you so dumb. We have to remember uh, that we make a lot of decisions in our schools. And some of those are business decisions as far as the operation of the school, more students, where budgets, where monies are allocated, how we get uh, New, new sports programs, more competitive in our, in our systems. Um, and sometimes we have an analysis of data that just really freezes us because we have too much data coming in. The image that you see on your screen is from an article on the cover of a hard copy magazine called The Letter from the Insurance Services Network. It's, uh, uh, you can see that on our website at firestorm.com and links to not only the article, uh, but the magazine itself. Um, but our CEO, Harry Rulin, is on the cover of that with this image and this quote. Technology is changing faster than anyone realizes. The rate of change is one of the biggest exposures the world faces today. Individuals, even those working in the technology field, are no longer able to forecast what the vulnerabilities and threats are of the technologies that are being created. 
interestingly, Hollywood does a better job of forecasting our exposures than people do. And I think that I think Harry's a Terminator fan, so I think part of that comes from there. But let's take it in. Let's look at it in reality. Five exabytes of content were created between what many consider of the world and 2003. And I forgot to mention that Roxanne the Wonder Dog is joining me today. So if you hear barking in the background, that's what that is. So five exabytes of content were created between the birth of the world and 2003. In 2013, five exabytes of content were created each day. That's pretty significant. Generally, our curiosity in things, grabbing data, finding data, is useful. We're wired to do that. In the past, when we were hunting, in we heard a rustle in the bushes. We needed to know if that was predator or prey. And those decisions that we make are the difference between life and death. We're wired to reduce uncertainty because our minds are adapted for another more dangerous time. Although I would say, based on my last trip to New York, that we still live in a pretty hazardous time. Our decisions are just a little bit different, so we need different data points. And we are, as a, as a human race, fascinated with filling information gaps. I mean, one of the greatest things about the human race is that we ask why. It's where our best science comes from. But that obsession can lead us astray, especially today when reducing uncertainty has just become all too easy. But how do you know you've reduced uncertainty with the right information? We call this the seduction of data. In business as usual, in your school or in your school district, what data do you use to make decisions? Every day, we create 2.5 quintiles quintillion bytes of data. I don't know about you, but I have no clue what a quintillion is. Now, our good friends at VoucherCloud, who did this graphic for us, tried to explain that 2.5 quintillion bytes of data would fill 10 million Blu-ray discs, the height of which stacked would measure the height of four Eiffel Towers, one on top of the other. All right, that's a little bit helpful. But it's an enormous amount of information. 90% of the world's data today has been created in the past two years alone. And that's increasing exponentially every day. So how do you go about business as unusual with all of this data, with 30,000 gigabytes of data a second coming at us? Recently, we worked with a school system that had a challenge with a sexting crisis in their midst. And the sexting crisis was coupled uh, with overtones of racism uh, that were not just in one school, but were starting to trickle down into some other uh, schools in a very large school system. Well. The first thing that the first person who happened to see a message on someone's phone did was confiscate the person's phone. We're not going to debate whether that's the right thing to do immediately or not. Um, but there was a lot of data on that phone, and it led them to confiscate another phone, and then another phone, and then another phone. At one point, they had 120 phones confiscated. And there were more to come. There was too much data. They couldn't absorb it all at one time. Meanwhile, were they supposed to call the police? Were they supposed to call the parents? Whose parents were they supposed to call? Who was a victim? Was this a victimless crime? Was it a crime? Suddenly, there was just too much data to process at one time. And people became frozen. And they weren't sure whether the data they were correct collecting was the right data. Is this even what we need to deal with this situation? Or are we 
being distracted. We call that seduction of uh, data, sorry I repeated that and I didn't mean to, um, with three types of data. The first is structured data. We're more familiar with this. It's been around for a long, long time. You know, the first time, if you can think back, I'm an old gal, uh, so I can think back the first time I saw an Excel spreadsheet and just thought it was so pretty, all those nice little rows and colors of data. Uh, structured data is information. It's usually text files. It's displayed in titled columns and rows. It is mineable. It is uh, logical data that's easy to mine. So what what you can do is picture this beautiful, nice, organized file cabinet, and that's what structured data is. It has a structure. Unstructured data cannot be so readily classified, and it is what we are creating at an exponentially large rate every day. Um, Instagram, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, uh, YouNow, uh, which is a video streaming. If, if you don't know what it is, please go look up YouNow at the end of this session. Um, and become aware of it. Periscope, videos, streaming instrument data, web pages, PDF files, PowerPoint presentations, there's so much data and information in unstructured data that's being created. And then there's dark data. Dark data is operational data that is just not being used. Gartner describes dark data as information assets that organizations collect, process, and store in the course of regular business activity but generally fail to use for other purposes. I thought I'd make a drawing for you to illustrate dark data. That's really the easiest drawing I've ever done. All kidding aside, once we have data, what we've got to do is manage it. One of the number one growing professions today, and you may lead many of your senior graduates uh, into colleges to study is data scientists. Data scientists assure that we are providing the right information to the right people in real time accurately and adequately. Now, in your school, it, you may uh, be a large school system, you may be small, uh, you may be a, a large district or one independent private school. Um, and so we don't always have the luxury of hiring a six-figure data scientist in our organization. Uh, so a lot of this has to fall to us individually, and that's why it's important that we discuss what kind of data do we need in calm and in crisis. What kind of data do we need to support timely and efficient decisions and assure that only the most relevant information goes to our decision makers to support their decision making process and responsibilities. Five years ago or so when Jim and I, Satterfield and I, Jim Satterfield is who you normally hear, he's on a plane to New York I think right now, um, Jim and I were deciding how we could best assist school systems uh, understand behaviors of concern either internally from students and staff and parents and others, um, also external threats that may be coming uh, at the school. So we had two different types of behaviors we really wanted to look at, two large buckets. And then within those buckets, uh, we have a variety of indiv indiv individual um, behaviors that we look at. And so we created our predictive intelligence program and we use a couple of different tools in order to look at the large aggregate conversations that are occurring publicly in traditional and new media and then when needed we focus in on a specific behavior of concern and supply that information to our decision makers at our client schools so that they can make clear, good decisions, and hopefully with our support. Last year, I'm very proud to say, we kept three guns out of three organizations. One gun we kept, we got 15 minutes prior to the school day starting. And the student later that day, 
on their Twitter account publicly posted, not only did they keep the gun from coming into school, but they got her clip of ammunition out of her locker as well. We do this through looking at massive amounts of data in a way that is not overwhelming and allows us to create very, very specific actions for our clients. You know, what's interesting, though, is who the data belongs to. In most organizations, when asked, decision makers that the responsibility for the data fell to the CFO, secondarily to the CIO, third to the chief operating officer, and then marketing and HR and other groups thereafter. It's interesting to us. Who in your school owns the data? Well, in school systems, people say, well, we, you know, we have an IT person who manages all of this. Well, does that person also understand the numbers data, or is that owned by someone else in your organization? And do these people share information with each other? is everyone have a seat at the table in a crisis? And then once we see that information, how do we know which information to use that makes logical sense to help us in the next step of decision making? It was a really interesting study that was done um, between Stanford University and Princeton. And a paper was written on the pursuit and misuse of useless information. And the bottom line from this was that decision makers may pursue non-instrumental information, information that appears relevant to the situation but actually would have no impact on, on choice. Once they pursue that information, they then use it to make their decision. And it may change what otherwise was a pretty good decision. Consequently, the pursuit of information that would have no impact on choice leads people to make choices they otherwise wouldn't have made. Well, let's think about this together. I'm going to give you a scenario. I'm going to give you two, but the first one you get to play along with. Imagine you're a loan officer, and you're at a bank, and you're reviewing the mortgage application of a recent college graduate. And the college graduate has a stable, well-paying job. They've got a solid credit history. And the ap applicant seems qualified to you. But during a routine credit check, you discover that for the last three months, the applicant hasn't paid a $5,000 debt to his charge card. Do you approve the mortgage application? Or do you reject the mortgage application? If you are like 71% of the people who participated in the original study, you reject the mortgage application. But the next group were asked to imagine themselves in the exact same scenario with one slight difference. There was the existence of two conflicting reports that made it unclear whether the outstanding debt was for $5,000 or $25,000. And you can't find out until tomorrow when the credit agency opens. You can make a decision today, or you can wait to find out. Overwhelmingly, people chose to delay the decision making. When given the opportunity to delay, people will take it. Then, after they contact the credit agency, they find out that the debt amount is the original $5,000 we discussed. Interestingly and overwhelmingly, the majority in this scenario chose to approve the mortgage application. The information was useless. That additional $25,000 question mark had nothing to do with the basic information. However, it significantly changed the decision. 
The greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. In your schools, in your school districts, you must make sure that the decisions you're making are being made based upon data that is important to the health, the safety, and the education of your charges, your staff, visitors, vendors, people on your campus, and ultimately your community. You know, in the past, technology moved slowly. The threats that were created evolved over time periods that were manageable. When the car, when the automobile was first invented, you know, we had time to watch it roll down the road and say, you know, I bet eventually those things are going to get a little faster. Maybe we should have some rules around how they go up and down the road. Maybe we should have signs. We don't have the luxury of that today. The rate of change today has made it such that information from yesterday may be useless tomorrow. It may be useless today. I don't even buy a phone anymore. I just wait till one of my friends who always likes new and shiny gets new and shiny and gives me their old. Because their old is good enough for me. I can't keep up with it. And I'm a tech head. I made a data graph for you to illustrate what happens when we have too much information coming in on a daily basis. Confusion is proportionate to how much data you have. If you don't have someone to help you weed through it to understand what we're looking for, because complexity doesn't equal clarity. I used to work with somebody who was a really great guy, and we would work on these really large projects for enterprise-level organizations. And he would come in with the most amazing spreadsheets. They were works of art. He had colors in those spreadsheets that we didn't even know existed in Excel. There were hundreds of pages, and they were interlinked. And no one ever had time to absorb all of the data that was in those spreadsheets. I used to feel so bad for him because he loved creating them. They were really beautiful, but they were just way over-engineered. Sometimes we just need a simple menu so that we can make a clear decision, especially in crisis. Because anytime we have data without insight, we risk poor decisions. And in a school organization, a poor decision can have drastic consequences. We're talking about more than just a bad analysis of a quarterly report. For schools, we're talking about assumptions made on flawed data that can actually cause harm. How about missing data? How do you know if you're making decisions based upon information that you don't have? How do you know what you don't know? Lack of visibility really is a problem when many decisions are made in organizations. Whenever someone feels that they own information and will not share it with other people in the organization, that's a good sign of an unhealthy organization. Siloed information is dangerous to an organization. It creates a lack of visibility that really impedes decision making. And flawed data is just one big distraction. You can go running down the road trying to track how many kids had a message group on their WhatsApp, on their telephones, without realizing that the core issue is that there's a pedophile in the midst of the messages soliciting images from the kids. That whole idea of not being able to see the forest for the trees. The other thing about having data is it's got to mean something. I mean, there's got to be a reason for it. I, I tried to give you a simple illustration of somebody saying, OK, how many emergency exits do we have for the school? Well, if you have a data collector, that 
data collector says, we've got 32. Not only that, 18 are covered by security cameras. Yay, I provided you with great information. The problem is, is the information actionable? Where are the exits located? If you don't have a map, you have no idea. Knowing that you have 32 or 102 doesn't make any difference at all if people are trapped in the situation and can't get out. Now, that most likely will never happen in your building or your organization. But it should be a simple illustration of what useless data does in a real crisis. Because information and insight equals intelligence. Data for data's sake doesn't equal anything. The first thing we do is look at different amounts of data. We analyze it. That creates actionable insights. And we can then recommend to you what the best course of action is in any given situation. Let's look at that a little bit more. How do you and your organization today make decisions? What role are you in to help either make decisions or support decision making? What is the process? Do you need to have a seat at the table that you don't? Can you go about assuring that you get one by providing good actionable data? Or are you someone that receives information and you need to assure that there aren't any empty chairs at your table? Do you have a trusted objective sounding board? We deal with crises every day from schools and other types of organizations. I have uh, recently a client that I work with, a school system in a, a major metropolitan city, has an allegation of racism that has occurred. And it is a challenging situation. Not only that, but because in a community, a school community, as you all well know, um, not only are you an employee or have employees in your school, but they have children in the school as well. Well, this is a personal one that hits home for someone in a senior level position with a student in the school. And because there is an emotional involvement, it is important that we act as that sounding board for our client as he walks through the decisions that need to be made to assure that the school system is acting in an appropriate and a legal manner. Additionally, we're able to look and help him think outside of the immediate situation about what may happen next and what additional data we can provide that can be helpful to that. We're able to monitor through our predictive intelligence platforms whether there's any additional bullying activity that's ongoing. We're able to look in other places to see if there are any other types of threats of violence or harm. You know, in a crisis, most <clears throat> decision makers are trying to make decisions based upon information, data, and policy as if business were going on as usual. But in a crisis, it's business as unusual. And information is generally wrong. Everything you think you know immediately is probably not at all what's really going on. Many times, often, your the phone rings at 2 o'clock in the morning, or it's just as you're getting up in the morning to get a cup of coffee, and you decide to quickly check your messages, and the crisis is unfolding. Well, <coughs> sadly, we live in a day and age where a lot of the information about this crisis may have occurred in a picture on Instagram. And you're just now hearing about it. It happened six hours ago while you were sound asleep. Six hours is an eternity in the world of social media. And people have now had six hours to make assumptions, spread rumor, <clears throat> uh, 
create innuendo and reach out to CNN, Fox News, NBC, ABC with information that's incorrect or highly confidential. And data is not available. You've got no policies to address this. They don't exist. I can remember back when I was first working in uh, predictive intelligence with Firestorm, one of the first messages that stopped me cold and, and really let me know that I was in the right profession with the right group of people was a message that came to on Twitter that said, oh, expletive, shots in the cafeteria. And it was when the Chardon, Ohio shooting took place. That played out second by second, minute by minute on social media. As a matter of fact, the names of the deceased students were released by students on Twitter before their parents had been notified. Students in lockdown, when there was an active shooter situation, were being approached by every major media organization via Twitter, and the students were responding, sure, I'll give an interview. There's something out there called Tweet Map that if your student has their geolocation turned on on their device, they can create a nice little map for me of next targets during an active lockdown. There was so much more that played out during that situation, but it was completely outside the experience of those folks in Chardon. They'd just never seen anything like this before. And the speed at which it escalated and became national news was already a horrific tragedy. But command and control were completely lost because of the speed at which it not only escalated, but misinformation escalated as well. And brand and reputation of the school was under attack of the families involved. Leadership then became involved and personally engaged. And this is something important to remember. In this or any situation, at times where senior leadership or educators or teachers become personally involved in even other students, they can be personally attacked. We've seen numerous situations where what started out as you know, a disagreement suddenly becomes a situation where someone's personal information is posted online. The website is hacked. The website crashes. Information is unavailable. Someone's personal address and phone number are released. Confidential servers are hacked because when you're at a vulnerable time, bad guys don't care. The impacts become disproportional, the events escalate, and suddenly speed of decision making becomes integral to the survival of your school or your school district. Your issue becomes the center of media focus. And what do you do if then you need to make decisions and data is unavailable. What if your website's crashed because every media person in the world is suddenly hitting your server to find out if you've got emergency information postage posted? What if that crashes everything? In a crisis, you get a you get to make a decision. You get to make a series of decisions, and this is what those decisions are. You can choose this, or you can choose that. But you have got to make a decision. You may make it based on too much data, wrong data, incorrect data, or you can make it through a streamlined, clear process that's been practiced and tested to assure the safety of your students, your employees, and your community. One of the things we really want you to understand is that we believe most threats can be identified before they occur. 
Firestorm develops predictive, actionable intelligence for clients. Now, my team works specifically around the analysis of social and new and traditional media, but Firestorm's program, such as our behavioral risk threat assessment, we call that Bertha. Think of it as Alice's big sister. We create a program and a plan that allows you to identify threats before they escalate into that call you get at 2 a.m. in the morning where something has been going on on your school property or grounds for the past six hours and you didn't know about it. We help you think about, analyze, and target threats and risks before they materialize. And as a result, we believe there's time for intervention. In many cases, the risk is mitigated or eliminated. That gun by that student who was, she actually tweeted out, I'm going to bring my gun to school today. And our team is trained to be able to look at the entire contextual history of someone's uh, commentary so that we understand, are we looking at lyrics to a song? Are we looking at playful banter between two people and they simply need to be counseled on their language? Are we looking at a real threat? Either way, we have a reporting procedure. We have a protocol for it. Either way, you're going to know. You're going to receive information. And you're going to receive information in a way that defines what your next steps need to be dependent upon the information we provide. You know, um, this is a nice quote of, uh, I found the Firestorm team of senior level advisors invaluable in navigating a crisis and guiding our company. Uh, we do the same thing, obviously, for school systems. In my opinion, their counsel and judgment were instrumental. That's what we do. Um, in this particular situation, you know, there was a team of attorneys, there was a team of auditors, there were a team of finance associates, there were senior level people, but he needed that sounding board, that objective third party. Party. So let's look at what that means. For your school or your school system, think about how mature you are when it comes to using data to make decisions. If you're like most schools that we initially start to work with, we get a call and says, we, we have a, an all-hands call that happens. Uh, where all of the founders and senior folks on the team will simply get an email that says all hands. And we call in to our conference call and generally uh, we have a school system client who is experiencing a crisis that they had not anticipated. They thought about, but they hadn't anticipated it. They didn't inspect it today. Sometimes we have two separate crises going on at the same time within a school or a school system. And everything the school does is in reaction to the situation. It's highly reactive. Additionally, there's a lot of debate on the process. So the, the uh, superintendent or the assistant superintendent or the principal or the board, somebody waves the danger flag and somebody else makes a decision. And so Somebody else says, no, that's the wrong decision. I wouldn't make that decision. And you spend your time arguing instead of solving the first problem, which is to make the first decision. And experts are always called in too late. There's always a high level of confusion. And there are changing assignments. The decision processes aren't clear. Some areas are overlooked. And you have some people doing the same tasks as other people because roles and responsibilities aren't defined. And that means other tasks are not getting done at all. It's difficult to obtain any data, much less good data. It's, you, you're slow to identify what data do I need, who do I need to notify in this situation, do I have their information in front of me, who's in charge of notifying those people. You've got the media reaching out to you and saying, hey, we're hearing rumors. There's something going on over there at their school. And you're very slow to respond to that. As a matter of fact, you think you have to respond to that when you don't. 
you don't have to make any comment to the media at all until you feel that you're in trouble and in charge through your channels. But if you do react, again, it's going to be reactive. The messaging is confused. And you'll miss key channels. Key, key people that you need to talk to, you won't talk to. You don't want them hearing about it via Facebook or the afternoon news. Now, stage two is when you get to a basic level of maturity in your decision-making processes. This is a pretty generic process. Somebody in business continuity or within the school and security maybe, they grabbed a plan off the web and they sort of use that as a template. Roles and responsibilities are kind of somewhat clear and defined, but they're more defined on the fly. And support resources are not defined. So you end up spending a lot more money on an issue than you would have had to otherwise. Basic data is somewhat defined, but there's a delayed response getting new data that you need to make decisions. And so that results in a lack of timely decision making. Again, you're reacting to events, uh, events and it's highly resource intensive. And some messaging is OK. Um, you, you sort of hit all major channels, but again, it's reactive messaging. And you're hearing people tell you, oh, we got to get out in front of this. We got to get out in front of this. And that leads you to you writing messages that are commercials, that are public relations, not crisis communications. And there is that big difference between the two. We want you to get at least to the point where you're in the pre-action phase. We really feel like we're beginning to nurture a healthy organization when we have a defined process structure, defined decision rights, clearly defined roles and responsibilities, supportive uh, resources are defined so you're not bleeding resources, your basic data that you need to make decisions is defined, and you know where additional data and who's in charge of it if you need more. Uh, within the organization where that's located. You, you're making good decisions in a timely basis. I can almost feel that we have a little more room to breathe right now. People aren't running around crazy, freaking out. We have folks doing what they need to do when they need to do it, which allows us the air to breathe and make better decisions. And we have a defined messaging process that allows us to deliver effective and timely messaging. And some of those messages are standardized because we did them ahead of time. We made sure our Twitter messages are 130 characters to leave room for a hashtag. We've got our Facebook images down. And we've got Instagram running. And what we want to get to is the stage four, the strategic phase. Let me show you what that looks like. Let's say we have a chart, and this is just part of a much, much larger plan and program. Um, as someone who's been in an elevator accident before, I can tell you that the building I was in did not have a crisis management plan for people getting stuck in an elevator for two hours at the top of a shaft, one with a broken foot. I can tell you for sure they did not because it took them forever to get us out of there because we had gone over the shaft. So what would you do in your organization if you had uh, a, a situation of violence on campus? What happened if you have a water leak? So what we do is we define the groups that respond and the actions they could should take through an action code. This creates a culture of strategic preparedness, not reactive. It creates a clear playbook for major crisis types with clear and known decision rights. Who makes the decision, when and how? Clearly defined and established roles and responsibilities, predefined by event type, support resources identified and assigned, all areas covered. The information is predefined and pre-established. And that way, when we need unique data, we know who to go to and how to get it. We have a highly efficient and timely decision process. And for people in our community, for our students, for our parents, for our board, this type of preparedness and resiliency is a brand attribute for our school. People say, I love sending my kids there. 
great leadership. They really know how to handle things. I feel like my son, my daughter is safe in this school because I've seen them handle a crisis and they handle it so well. They have a highly efficient decision-making process. They don't spend our money on useless decision-making. And they have a proven communication process to make sure that everybody knows what's going on in case of crisis. Next steps. We want to help you, as I've said, make great decisions. If you'd like to start that pro process, We'll sit down with you. We can do it over the phone or face-to-face. -face. Let's do an assessment together. We'll waive the fee for the assessment because you're a member of the Georgia uh, Independent School Association. It's a $2,500 value. And because you're in Georgia, you probably get Jim Satterfield. Uh, we'll go ahead and analyze relevant data and create great insight and intelligence for you. And then you can have the decision to move forward and create a robust intelligence network and develop plans that are specific to your school, your organization, your campus, your district, with specific action plans for each threat. And then, of course, we want to train, 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 test, test, test. If you'd like to be a part of any upcoming virtual cyber stress tests that we're having, we had some great participation from Jesus Schools in the last couple that we did. We had folks tweet uh, pictures of their teams uh, in conference rooms participating. We sincerely appreciate that participation. And we do have a cyber breach exercise coming up on May 25th and on June 14th. Please visit our website at firestorm.com and sign up to attend the communicable illness stress test. It's a virtual stress test. It'll be your summer in service. And we look forward to seeing you at that. Again, my name is Karen Masulo. Feel free to email me at kmasulo at firestorm.com. You can download a brief of today's session and watch the webinar recording in a couple of hours when it's posted by visiting firestorm.com forward slash briefs or looking under recorded webinars and briefs under resources on our website. And we thank you for attending today. Contact us at webinars at firestorm.com with any questions, and you can call us at our 1-800-321-2219, and you get to speak to Bill Baker personally. Thank you so much for your time today. We look forward to speaking to you next month, and this will conclude today's session. Have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you, Karen. Goodbye.